Hi dancers, welcome back to Conversations with the Pros. Tonight I am chatting with New York City ballet soloist and author of Swan Dive, also aka the rogue ballerina Georgina Pascoquin. Hi! Hi, how are you Rachel? Oh, I'm good. Thank you so much for joining me tonight, Georgina. I know all about you because I've been following you for quite some time, but I would love you to give us a great introduction about who you are, where you dance, and a little bit about your journey uh, from pre-professional to professional, just so that everyone can catch up who's watching. Sure thing. Um, tall order. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my name is Georgina Pascogan. For those of you who do not know who I am, and I am started dancing at the age of four in Altoona, Pennsylvania, and moved to New York at the age of 16 to study at the School of American Ballet, kind of finished my schooling, and I was fortunate enough to be selected to join the New York City Ballet as an apprentice in um, 2002. And I have been there ever since. Oh my God, I can't believe I just admitted that. I have completely <laughs> aged myself. <laughs> um, but the time I see, it, it, it's flown by. I think, yeah. you know, I am team New York City Ballet at heart. Um, I didn't start out that way though. I really thought I was going to spend my career at San Francisco Ballet. That was the <laughs> company that I dreamed of joining. Mm. I never... I actually never dreamed I would get into New York City Ballet. I think just because of some of the um, the, the stereotypes that I was told, you know, I was made aware of when I was a kid uh -huh. auditioning for summer and programs. But um, I, you know, things have. I really owe my um, my journey to New York City Ballet to Susie Handel, may she rest in peace, and the one, the only, the incomparable Suki Shore. Sure. Absolutely. And you mentioned, you know, a lot of those stereotypes when you were putting yourself back into those sh point shoes when you were younger, how was it navigating and being able to uh, challenge the stereotypes that you were hearing to still pursue this, you know, this path that you have led? Because a lot of younger dancers do get very um, down on themselves, especially, and you mentioned summer intensives. I think that's a big uh, site where a lot of dancers can question what's going to be with their future career. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is, it is, if it's not already, it is going to be audition season soon. Yes. So mm -hmm. mucho miedo to everyone <laughs> who is going to be auditioning. That is not an easy time. Um, I think in terms of my, I, I, I'm just so, <laughs> I'm the ultimate narcissist, which is really a bad, it's a, it's a negative thing, but I never really, um, I didn't think about, yes, I, I knew that at that point when I was 14, New York City Ballet was trending very tall um, for women. Clearly, I'm not the tallest. Um, mm -hmm. There are stools. You can't see any of the stools in my apartment now, but I have various stools to reach all of ah. the, I have nice parlor floor ceilings so things are very high in my apartment um but I I didn't think that was a barrier I didn't think sure. I, you know listen I had this I had this extreme passion and this love for the expression of dance mm. and I had been looking over your um our guideline of questions that we were our talking points that we were going to talk sure. through and I just I it, it wasn't that I wasn't hearing these things. Obviously, you know, I've, I've written this book and I've talked about how all of this has this one way or another through osmosis uh, contributed to this immense anxiety that I live with on a daily day to day basis. But um, I and when it came, when it comes to dancing, when you distill it down to the act of plies, tendus, it's really, truly a joy. And when I, when I come down to, like, I, I wasn't thinking going into this, in my audition for School of American Ballet, like, oh, I'm already not the type. I just wanted to dance because I love to dance. And it was one of my first classes with a live pianist. And how special is that? I just, I think, you know, there's so much talk about mindfulness and being present these days. And I think I, if one can... And, and granted, I, I think I had it a lot easier growing up because I didn't have 
this platform, which I, sure. you know, for, for better, or for worse, I think does more, <laughs> more harm to our psyches than it does help. And someday these platforms won't exist in this, mm. in this iteration. I am truly thinking that society is going to shift away from this, but, mm. but in cases like this conversation, like you and I would have never really had the chance to discuss and to chat. And so I'm really thankful for it. And I'm thankful for you, you know, lifting up my voice on this platform to kind of share some of my ideas that I've been stewing around. Um, mm. So for dancers, just, thinking about auditioning and and hearing, you know, um, stereotypes and rumors that they don't see themselves fitting into for, for better, for worse. I mean, that's kind of why I have the moniker, the rogue ballerina. Mm. It was this embracing of everything that I am not in mm. the ballet world and spinning it into the best possible scenario for me and I truly believe that's what makes me um, special and unique has been, it, it's been embracing what I bring to the table that no one else does. Yeah. And every single person listening in on this call has that same ability. Yeah. It's just getting to know oneself and honing in on what those abilities are. Yeah. And a big word that I'm going to say that it sounds like, and I'm curious if you've always had this or if this is something that has maybe always been within you, but has grown over time, big word is confidence. Having confidence in ourselves, and this is what a lot of younger dancers, I believe, need assistance with, um, because it can be so easy to, like you said, you, you heard it all as you were going through your schooling, right? But at what is the point at which those um, what someone is overhearing in regards to the stereotypes and thinking in that realm, what is the point at which where it can derail someone versus where it can fuel someone into becoming the rogue ballerina and saying, you know what, I, I hear what, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not accepting it. Well, well, I mean, I don't, I can't say that I've like always had this, this confidence that I see okay. here now as, sure. you know, as a woman well within my thirties, like what, a, like what an awesome place to be. I yes. mean, like I wouldn't want to relive my teens and my twenties at all. And that's yes. not to say that those aren't great decades, but they are, they are passages, especially for women. And I can't, I can't speak for any uh, young male dancers or male dancers who are, are listening in, but I can speak to this woman experience and and identifying as you know a cisgender straight woman like it's it's a and especially in our world of ballet and how young you're asked to become an adult yeah and how many adult situations you're placed in as an absolute abject child mm. it is um so it was it's not confidence i am 1000 percent stubborn Mm. And I, when I set my mind on something, I will, when, when I decide to commit to something, I go 100% all the way. Yeah. Um, I think there, there was just like a random, like social anxiety quote of how <laughs> I, I think it was Rachmaninoff and he met on like another computer. I'm totally butchering this. Please do not <laughs> Google based off of what I said. It's some sort of meme on the interwebs, but yeah. like. He heard that another composer friend liked honey and showed up in the middle of the night to that composer's house with like a full giant jar of honey. I am that person. I am that yeah. person. Um, I, and so I think a stubbornness can be also be a negative attribute. But I think in terms when it comes to to ballet and the pursuit of ballet and how often mm -hmm. you have to critique one, not only oneself, but be able to take critiques mm. because it's part of our training to, to, to get corrections sure. and to take direction. And, um, I think, I think confidence definitely comes with time. And I think that there have been some wonderful discussions about teaching and how to teach and lift up. Yes. Um, it, it, it's it's and I am realizing that there is and I'm wondering if we can link it in our 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 talk later. It's uh, a, I'm 
a total nerd and I listened to shortwave podcasts uh, by NPR and there it was um this podcast about math and Mm. and using gender to help teach math and I was like this is random and it turned out to be this I learned two different words ingressive versus congressive and congressive is sort of teaching with a community and, and not necessarily making competition, which is ingressive yeah. um, out of everything. And if you think about it, we really do in our society make a competition out of everything. I mean, weren't the Golden Globes yesterday? I mean, yeah. just the fact that we were able to make, like, I mean, how do you, how do you award art? How, how? Yeah do we like really truly I mean yes yes there are wonderful deserving performances I'm so excited about my friend Ariana DeBose uh, the whole West Side Story team Succession um I have a lot of friends in that show and I'm Mm -hmm. so proud of them but like we do we really need a competition Mm. to make to make art worthy and like these are all shows that were either started to be filmed or perhaps were filmed just before the pandemic or filmed right after, uh, during what an, what an incredible achievement just in general. So it's, it's not to say that to get rid of any and all awards, but just the idea that like teaching and what I really wish we could move towards in the ballet world, specifically a professional company, is not pitting women against each other in competition yeah. and not in, in this more idea that we are congressive. And I think, you know, I, I, in my book, Lane Swan Dive, I like lay out the differences I experienced in um, the Broadway world versus the ballet world. And I think this is, this is just a further clarification for me in that, like, I felt that there was more of a congressive environment in a Broadway theater, like you from, from usher to stagehand to stage manager to cast crew, sound, everyone is pulling together to put that show on and everyone is treated like an adult because we all are adults. Yeah. And, and I think that the ballet world, we are making steps towards changing um, environments, changing uh, this a, a pack mentality, if you will, however you want to think about it. But I mm-hmm. we still have a long way to go. Um, yeah. I, I, oh my gosh, so much that I, would like to touch on um sorry I really I really derailed (laughs) no it's it's perfect I I tend to derail a lot on these chats but you brought up a lot of good points first thing um in regard to the competition and tying in just the idea of social media and going back again to what you and even I in my training as a younger dancer didn't have was the competition that social media breeds Mm -hmm. for a lot of dancers and the fact that I'd be curious to hear if you agree with this or disagree um, the idea of it taking away a little bit from the actual art of the art form you know about it being just about the tricks that dancers do rather than than uh, perhaps being about the storytelling that a dancer can do on stage and how we can transcend an audience. Um, so I'm what I notice is uh, in regard to the more negative implications of social media, there are the comparisons and the triggering content and the fact that we are overloaded with content, whether it be about diet, whether it be about uh, just different types of training and you mentioned this as well but just like the overall rhetoric of the ballet culture the perhaps like grind culture for however anyone wants to describe it um can be very much exemplified on social media as being uh not so helpful for especially the younger dancers do i think that social media and it oh the art of it all absolutely i think social media like it 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 did dilutes in the worst way what our process is truly as artists and and in speaking specifically about ballet because to me I I am not I am not like a trickster yes I like to jump and turn but I am I am not someone that's that's ever played to that I'm also someone that like 
if there's a ton of competition in the room, I will just walk out. Like mm-hmm. I, I can't like in, in a company class, if it's getting too, uh, it, it, too competitive, I mm-hmm. turn off because like, I, and at this point, and I know that I speak from a, a place of privilege because I, I'm a soloist in New York City Ballet. I don't necessarily need to be like up front and center, you sure. know, hungry for it because I, I've, I've made, I've, I've, I've made a stamp on who mm-hmm. I am and I continue to make a stamp for better or for worse, whether it ends my career or not on, you know, my viewpoints and how I think the world should change. Sure. Um, but I, I think what, what I, when I, the few times I love, I get to be in the audience, what moves me as a dancer and I believe myself to be a dancer's dancer mm. and uh, is it's not the tricks. I don't remember the tricks. I will, I respect when someone executes 32 fuetes and finishes and finishes cleanly and enjoys it and is able, but you know what makes me cry? What I go home thinking about is the way the women just found a way to make eye contact with her partner. Yeah. The way she takes a hand, the way she, the, the, the gentleness versus the athleticism, finding ways to make nuance. I don't want to see the same dancer do the same role 18 times the exact same way. That makes my head explode. I don't, it, like, I'm, we are not machines as people. <laughs> And yeah. I do not want to see it on stage. I just, I just don't, that is not it for me. And it's mm-hmm. difficult, especially when you are a dancer, like it, it I, why I'm, I'm speak for myself. Like it's difficult for me as a dancer who does not view every, that every show needs to be the exact same. And you can be infused by the happenings of the real world coming in you have to set it aside a little bit to be able to do our job otherwise most of the time I'd be in tears going on stage but it's you can use that and that can infuse your performances and that's what makes people suspend their disbelief and takes them out that's that's uh, our job at the end of the day we are still entertainers yeah and I want I, I want to be able to entertain. I am a storyteller. So whether it's a balancing black or white or not, I'm doing this, I'm doing this background work for, for myself because that's how I work best. Yeah. I, I like to tell a story. I like to have something going on in my head. It's not just about the eight count. And I know that, that frustrates uh, a, an older generation who just want a, don't ask questions. Here's the thing. Here are the steps. Here are the counts stay in this frame I I just am I just not I'm just not that artist yeah and you know adding experience into the already set structure of ballet for example whatever ballet it might be just adds so much depth and on that experience I do want to talk a little bit about balance because a lot of dancers can get very hyper focused in their training Um, especially again I keep going back to the younger dancers but I know that's the main audience who's going to be listening to this chat it can be very easy for them to hyper focus into what they're doing and like you said um in your standpoint, coming from that place of privilege in the sense of being a soloist, not necessarily being as hungry to reach that point yet. But how can dancers, and I'm curious to hear with your own experience and your training, make sure that they're still gaining balance throughout their lives so that they can bring those experiences into the studio. And they're not just, for example, Rachel, the bunhead. I mean, I, I do, I want to say this because I know that they're like, if you are as intense of a teenager as I was trying sure. to get a job in dance or trying to, um, or just loving something so much that you must do it, that, that is, that there, there is a passion to that. And, and we, and Rachel and I are not saying that you, you, sh- you should, not give in to that on occasion, but I, I do think that as we continue to learn, especially learn more about the female body and how we develop, sure. it is so important for us to to not overtrain. And I think that it, it's it's hard because there is a certain part of our development 
as pre-professional artists in which we do have to push. We have to push through. You have to get tired or else you're not going to get stronger. You have to Mm -hmm. eat the relevés. You have to have the calves burn, but you don't want to tear the calf. Mm -hmm. And so I have learned that lesson the hard way. Mm. And I do not, and I think that's where I can speak from in, in, in being, listen, somewhat of a mentor, I, you know, I, I sit here, you know, one of the, well, the first Asian American woman to yeah. ever be promoted out of New York City yeah. Ballet's core. You don't think that took a lot of extra work, a lot of extra drive, the cost of that. It, it It's there, but it's also... I, I, I think you need that drive sure. but also what what I always had in my training um and in this immense curiosity I, I, I think I'm always going to be a perpetual student is I loved to cross train with other forms of dance like I would go when I uh, um we and testament to Allegheny Ballet Academy, which no longer exists. Um, we had, you know, uh, Spence Ford come in and teach Fosse jazz. Mm-hmm. So I had influences before I even knew, you know, I was obsessed with Celtic um, yeah. d- dancing. So then I, you know, and then fused into tap dancing. And then I took I, summer courses, had West African classes and just learning like those kinds of experience. I helped like, just branching out in that way um, gave me more fuel to come back to the ballet class. Yeah. And yeah. take some of those lessons, this work-life balance. Yeah. And I think I, once again, I had it easier because I was one of six kids. When mm-hmm. I was at home, it's very hard to be focused sure. on yeah. ballet when you have three brothers who are going, we're going to build forts, we're going to get into trouble, we're going to be out, right. and, a, a, and a baby sister, and, and, and so I had this, um, this lively, loud Filipino-Italian family that, I, that, for better, for worse, and, and not saying that, like, I had this, like, pristine childhood, no, um, that, gave me this um this idea and also like my my father's in the army reserves so Mm -hmm. he would go away my brother's also you know my brother's stationed in Poland right now and and so like that gives me a little outside life balance so I think I always had a a, um a perspective yeah that was like this is just ballet and 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 but in the same vein you know sometimes now where I sit and, and knowing and having been through all of, of I, what I have experienced throughout my career, it's, I still find the stage to be a safe space. Mm. And that's not going to be the same for every artist. And, and I, I, I know that that's not. I have very close friends who have a completely different experience of stage. That is not their favorite time. Yeah. I love the process of rehearsal coming back to like how Instagram like doesn't show those processes. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that. I, I, I love the act of being in process. And I think real art can't be demonstrated in its totality in a 30 second reel. Process of self-discovery that mm-hmm. um, it's not about getting from point A to point Z in regard to just this linear one track path. It's a matter of actually experiencing and experiencing not just positive, but actually a lot of negative and a lot of neutral and coming to terms with making space for those experiences and that self-discovery to eventually get to a place where you are more confident in with yourself, in your body, with your dancing. And I think one of the major takeaways that I'm getting from this conversation is just allowing for that process, which can be difficult for a lot of dancers who might be, I know for myself, anxious, uh, maybe not so patient, but I just, I love hearing about your process and um, how it has taken a bit of time for you to get to where you are now in regard to how you feel now. 
But listen, if I had my way, it would have happened so fast. And I would <laughs> not be, and I would have, I, and I would achieve much more than sure, yes. what my career might. Um, that's not making light of the things that I have been able to see. I'm still unlearning and trying to like, that's yes. therapy on myself. Yes. Um, I was just about to put myself down. Um, this, I think that we, anyone that's on, on this, on the call. Wow. I really need to come into the age. <laughs> I think just realize that we are going to hear no so much more than we're going to hear. Yes. Yeah. And it's taken me this, this, this is almost like a forced process mm-hmm. of self-discovery because I've heard no so many times. So I had to yeah. circumvent the no to find my yes. Mm-hmm. And I, I am determined and here we are again, stubborn enough to find my yes by any means possible. Yeah. Like, ha- like how, and I, and trust me, if, for those of you who haven't read Swan Dive, like, and I was I, I, like, there are things that I've done that I'm not proud of, especially mm-hmm. to my vessel, to my body. Sure. And I am, I'm, I'm, it's taking me so much time to, to love this body yeah, and to understand how it has taken me so far and how through overtraining and not eating properly and, and just abusing it, like it, she still is with me and, yeah. and it's incredible. Just, I think if there's one thing that I can say from having made most of the mistakes, you know, dancing through injuries and, sure. and doing extreme choices with my body is that you really must respect your vessel. And I, you know, and when it, it's just, what, and when it comes down to just straight up payment for our art, I wish that leaders and the people, the boards, the executive directors understood what it actually takes to recover and how much money these days that takes, because it is a commitment and it is a 1000% of financial commitment. And I, I just like, I, I, Artists are never paid what they're worth, but right. I just, we are also athletes and to be able to do, I, just, I mean, I still think it's wild that most, you know, insurances don't take acupuncture. Yeah. It won't cover, I think that, I think healthcare and, and here you are again, just one way this Western medicine, mm-hmm. it's not, it, it's not necessarily the only way. I mean, sure. I think, I, I think I, acupuncture has been a huge help to me. And so like, yeah, I will, I will, that is money well spent. Um, yeah. And, and, and taking care of and cherishing this body especially as I ask it to do things as we continue to age. And I feel like there's a lot of dancers that don't talk about what it is to have an aging dancer's body. I mean, like, you know, we have the joke that you hit 27. No one on this call, I think is probably 27. (laughs) (laughs) But, and things get harder, but it's like that, the process of taking care of your body needs to happen so much sooner. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Just as a quick example, one thing that I'm always educating about is our bone health and our bone health is becoming set as a framework from the time we are 15 years old through 27. I mean, those are our, what we call our like peak bone building years, just as a very specific example of, you know, where this work and this proactive approach of caring for our vessel, as you say, which I love, uh, is just so important. And one thing that is also another major takeaway here is just the uh, two ideas of body respect and body appreciation. It's not necessarily about uh, hopefully we can get to a place of body acceptance, but if that's not available to someone in this moment, then thinking about body respect and just appreciating what we, our body is doing for us. And that, like, as you said, even after what you've been through and what your body has been through, she's still there for you. Uh, that's something that's really awesome and something that we can uh, shift the perspective a little bit and think and, and appreciate our bodies for and how yeah. we are asked to do things at such a, 
a young age and you know like I Absolutely. I very much like you have to put on point shoes early on like we have yeah. to we have to develop these muscles we have to uh ask our bodies to do things that they were never intended to do <laughs> yeah sure uh, because sure. Uh, th listen ballet is not going to be taken off point anytime soon <laughs> however what these things what we can what we can do as dancers i'm speaking for myself now and it's applicable to everyone listening in is to understand that our limits of our bodies aren't going to match mm. our friends limits of our friends bodies and like we can awe at what our friends are able to do but they are awing right back and it's a reciprocal situation. And I think coming back to this idea of this like ingressive, this competition to we're making competition where competition does not need to be. Sure. Um, that's a place where we can once again, flip the script and, and find a ways to help support each other through the really hard time that it is to be, a pre-professional dancer really wanting to to aim to get into a professional company to ha to 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 get to live the dream and not everyone gets to do that at the end of the day but like I think we all are trying to reach the same goal and this process of training to get there should we shouldn't already be at each other's throat yeah absolutely so please talk to us a little bit about the work that you do at Final Bow for Yellow Face, which I know you mentioned to me earlier is transitioning. Gold standard arts. Yeah, gold standard arts. Um, so fin Final Bow for Yellow Face was, it is still very much a pledge and mm -hmm. um, it's, it just was, it's, it's an affirmation of anyone who signs it that they love ballet in order for ballet to survive generations into the future we have to eliminate outdated and offensive stereotypes on our stages um and so it has grown these past five years more and 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 i think it um entered the cultural discussion in ballet Absolutely. so much more broadly than i than phil and i ever imagined and i have to give a shout out to phil chan for just being my co my co-pilot, my partner in change and all of this. And um, our next step for Gold Standard Arts is we are really going to make a community of, of, of Asian artists. And yeah. we are going to change, like no longer is the pressure just going to be on the one sole Asian dancer to make it. Mm. The, you know, the, the, the one choreographer that we want to flood the schools yeah. with, with, new talent with and, and appreciate the talent that is ready and ripe now Ooh. I don't think that that's another thing is that there's such an obsession with youth in our art form mm -hmm. and granted that's because it is extremely athletic sure. but I think there's also something to really be cherished and 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 I don't think I think it's unwise for um for leaders and for artists themselves to discount discount themselves once they reach a certain age and haven't made it to where they think they're going to make it because you know I it, I am still improving as a dancer yeah I am still making epiphanies in my artistry and I that's never going to stop mm -hmm. there's no there's no mastering of this art form that, I mean, that's just like, yeah, there are titles, but that doesn't mean the learning's over. That doesn't mean that the journey stops. It's something that we can continue on and, and the lessons that we learn all, along the way, just with the discipline of class and, and the determination, the, the, uh, I'm missing that. Just, well, the passion. You have to have passion. If you're going to wake up every day and choose to dance for a living, it's mm -hmm. not, especially now where it, everything seems so up in the air. I mean, we didn't, we didn't even have a season a couple days ago. Yeah. And it's just absolutely. like, and I'm just, it's, it's learning to be flexible in every sense of the word, not just ligaments. It's, yeah. it's just with, um, 
mind and grace. And I, I think that these are all lessons that one can take outside of the studio. Absolutely. And experience. I mean, one thing that I don't want, I say this lightly, but like older dancers have that younger dancers don't quite have yet is experience and so much of that so much of that journey so much of that self-discovery that you've built over these years you are able to bring to the stage and bring to the stage just as you mentioned in the very beginning of our chat in different ways right doing the same performance 18 times but having that performance be different 18 times is it is incredible you know what I mean like that's where we see the variations in artistry and that's where we can integrate the technicality of our art or the athleticism of our art and then the actual artistry of the art yeah I mean it was it's always at my viewpoint especially in doing uh Parada work. I mean, yeah. you cannot, especially when you're dancing with someone else on stage, it's impossible to recreate. Like there's always going to be a certain amount of unknown in, in that sort of journey. And I, I, I just, I think I really wish more dancers would be okay with like, okay, so yeah, aim for the triple, aim mm -hmm. for the, what, go for it. But know that it is not the end of the world if you mm -hmm. don't hit it or you get out there and you start to feel like you're not you're not necessarily in the pocket choosing choosing a different pathway is always it it, it the time is yours on stage is what yeah. I tell my students yeah and I I know that people might disagree with me but like you you practice and you rehearse and you listen and you apply in that space. But once you get on stage, that is your time and your time alone. No one else is there with you. Mm. So it, that's where you find your agency. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I love that word, definitely. So the final question that I have for you, Georgina, one that I ask everyone on here, how would you define, it's a bit of a loaded question, uh, but how would you define the healthy dancer? Um, is there such a thing as a healthy dancer? Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a really great point. I like that. I, I don't think I have an answer for that question. I have, I have provoking thoughts. I think. Give them to me. I think. And I think it's, I'm going to frame it in terms of being a healthy artist. Yeah. It's, um, and I'm going to frame it in ways that I question myself and like, are you, cause we all experience pain in our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Are you living in that pain so you can reach your artistic high? That's not healthy. Sure. So, or are you are you disassociating from your outside world to be in this world? Like that's also not healthy, but are you continuing? Do you get up every day and you want to go to dance to class because you love it? That, that to me is healthy. Yeah. And, and understanding the differences of wanting to and needing to that's a very fine nuanced place and we are artists we are like a lot of us have been conditioned to not use our voices yeah and to not speak up when things don't feel right to not to dance through injuries to dance through to, to not speak up when situations are make us feel uncomfortable um I think it's it's finding space. If you can go home every night after you do your train your ballet class and do your homework, or in my case, after I do my various calls, mm -hmm. write my essays, mm -hmm. um, and in in rehearsals, and after I take my bath and and shut my eyes, knowing that I have done to the best of my ability what I've achieved today 
I think that's a step towards being a healthy dancer. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that I do try and work on just in my own community here at To The Point Nutrition and with the dancers that I do work with is just this redefining and reclaiming of what it actually means, that word healthy, and how our society that we live in both at large and in the dance industry has unfortunately uh, built this definition around the word healthy uh, in regards to really being two dimensional. It's like, if you just fit this quote unquote specific mold, you are seen as being quote unquote healthy. And if you don't fit it, then you're not healthy, which is very much not true and not the case. And it's important for all of us, which is what you're describing is to utilize that self-discovery to redefine what healthy means to ourselves because you can do what society kind of like tells you to do in regards to what it seems to like to be quote-unquote healthy and be miserable when you wake up and not want to go into the studio and just like you said is it healthy to feel that way but quote-unquote to be doing everything quote-unquote right no, not healthy, right? Everyone's healthy is different. Um, and it's so important for us to utilize self-discovery to redefine and reclaim what our personal healthy is, not what we are, like you said, being kind of conditioned to feel. And I think it's okay. It's okay to redirect. Yeah. I think it, it's, it's all right to be like, whoa, that was the wrong way. I have done that yes. so many yes. times. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's a one step forward, one step back, one step forward, yeah. one step back. It's not like, like you said, and I think it's safe to say that nothing like so little, so few, or I don't even know the right, right. So little of this experience, human experience is binary. Yes, absolutely. We so, live in the in-between. Yeah. Um, but so often we are conditioned to think that it should be binary. And, and the point is that I that you're making and then even I'm making is that it's not. It's that it's make space for being uncomfortable and make space for cha challenging um, what can be challenged. And uh, like you said, having a voice, utilizing that voice, if, especially if, you know, if a dancer, I always like to mention, like, as long as a dancer feels safe to do so and who they can approach that is a safe space to do so is super important. One thing, by the way, that actually brings me back to what you said is assessing if the stage feels like a safe place for you. And when it doesn't, what's kind of off kilter in your work-life balance? Why does it not feel like that? I know for me personally, I, I got to a point in my dancing career where it wasn't, it didn't feel that way for me. It didn't feel safe. And that's when I had to take like 500 steps back and decide to become a dietitian. <laughs> um, and that's how I was able to find a safe space again in the dance world where I felt like I can, you know, contribute and, and be where I wanted to be. And I, I think that's, that was a really good marker that you mentioned that dancers can kind of think about is, you know, why doesn't it feel good to you right now? Like what is, is what else is going on? Yeah. It's, it's usually, you know, like if we are, we are, we are screaming impatience, it, we feel these, like, I call it the comedian in our head. There's usually yeah. some other thing that's going on yeah and it's not just wrapped up in this, this we we aren't we aren't just it's not just one thought it's not just the dumb pirouette yes know? yes absolutely Georgina thank you so much for joining me tonight you have given us such valuable insight it's been a pleasure speaking with you well thank you so much for having me